All right. We're live on both, he says. All right. Here we go, folks. Uh, I've been told we're live like three times already. So I'm going with the third time is a charm. And uh, thank you all for being here. You know that normally we do these Wednesday night things called Elk Talk Live, brought to you by Go Hunt Insider. Well, I just released a pronghorn antelope class out on outdoor class. Been a couple years in the making. And I thought, since we get so many pronghorn questions mixed in with elk questions, let's do antelope talk live or pronghorn live or whatever you want to call it. And we're doing that tonight. Uh, it's uh, brought to you by Outdoor Class. And if you have any questions about Outdoor Class, I'm just going to tell you in one sentence. It is the best hunting and outdoor education you're going to find. Go to outdoorclass.com, use promo code Randy, and they'll give you $20 off the subscription. And tonight, sitting right over behind my computer here is the man himself, the executive producer, the guy in charge of all this super high quality stuff you see at Outdoor Class. The guy who probably says, I hope I never have to do another pronghorn hunt with or class with Randy Newberg again. Ryan Bailey is over there, and he's logged in with the Outdoor Class YouTube channel. So uh, this is going to be mostly question and answer. We're going to throw in a few preview clips of this newly released pronghorn course that I have out there. And uh, so we're going to start it off here with a short clip uh, from there. This is uh, a little preview that you get from, I think it's chapter two, and it's about the uniqueness of pronghorn. I could tell you what it is, but watch the clip and you'll know. Stock horns. These cool, kind of funky shaped jet black horns intrigue me and I'm sure they intrigue you. Unlike most other species we hunt, buck pronghorn often express their greatest horn growth at younger ages usually peaking from age three to four. They happen to be the only annually deciduous horned animal in North America. In other words, they grow horns, not antlers, but they shed the outer portion of those horns each November, retaining a cone-shaped core from which the next set of horns starts to grow. So, there's the clip, right? Pronghorn horn growth. Can peak at three years, sometimes four, but a three-year-old pronghorn sometimes has maximized his horn growth. And they're also the only animal we have in North America that is a horned animal that sheds. They're called deciduous horn growth. In other words, just like a deciduous tree, right? Leaves drop off every year. Same with pronghorn. So, uh, hopefully... That gives you a little primer. We're going to play a few more clips along the way, uh, give you a few ideas of what's in this course. Uh, but like I said, uh, Ryan Bailey, the executive producer of Outdoor Class, he's going to be chiming in here, answering some of the questions. Uh, I'm going to answer some of the questions. I'm reading them through a scroll over here. I'm reading them where we have a, a Google Doc over here. So if you see me looking around this way and then that way, I got all kinds of feeds that are telling me what the questions are. Uh, so this is uh, Montana Game Call it says, Randy, this is wonderful. Was very pleased to see this. I'm surprised. Well, maybe I'm not surprised. How many people have told us that? Oh, about time somebody does a pronghorn course. And we don't care if you call them antelope. We don't care if you call them pronghorn. In the office here, it, there used to be a light beer commercial where one side would say, tastes great. Other side, less filling. Tastes great. Less filling. Well, on one side of the office, we say antelope. And on my side of the office, I say pronghorn. I don't care what you call it. Doesn't matter. It's, uh, it's one of those cool, really cool animals that is unique to North America. Uh, if you've ever got a chance to hunt them, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's a ton of fun. They're great eating. Well, until a hard winter like this, it's usually easy to get tags. Uh, sometimes you, you know, if you're an archery hunter, especially, it's way easier to get tags than it is as a rifle hunter. But 
Dean Haley from Big Fork, Minnesota has this question. Would you wait a few years now, given Wyoming is having such a brutal winter? Yeah, uh, here's what we're going to end up with, folks. We're going to lose all the fawns that were born in May, late May of 2022. They're talking 80, 90 plus percent mortality in Wyoming, probably similar in parts of eastern Montana, probably similar in parts of northern Colorado. So we're going to lose that age class that was born in 2022. And here's the other part. As a survival mechanism, whether we're talking elk, deer, pronghorn, when a doe or a cow elk is carrying a fetus and it becomes life or death for her, like she's right on that edge of perishing, well, very often she will abort that that fawn or that calf. So we're going to lose a lot of the young ones that would have been born in May of 2023. So we're talking about, in some places, completely unprecedented winter, like a winter since no one can remember. You know, there are people in Wyoming talking about the winter of, eight, I think, 84, 85. That's almost 40 years ago. And there's some people are saying it was even worse than that. So how far back do you go? We've never seen our current wildlife, in this case, pronghorn populations, and how they've responded to a winter as hard as what they've had in Montana, but mostly in Wyoming and to some degree in uh, Colorado. So uh, <clears throat> just brutal, right? But here's what it goes to tell us specifically, that the focus on habitat, the focus on migration corridors is paramount. You know, pronghorn, I mean, like any species, are way more resilient to predation and way more resilient to hard weather if they have premium, premium, top-notch, first-class habitat. As quick as that habitat becomes compromised, compromised, and we have fences and roads and cities and other stuff that block their migration corridors, it's hard for them to adapt. This is not how they evolved. They didn't evolve being stuck to small places or having their migration routes cut off. They used to be able to move across the entire landscape to get to wherever the food was, and it would have less impact on a winter like this. And unfortunately, that's not how the landscape is now. So, uh, Burma, uh, one of our Fresh Tracks Plus sub subscribers says, oh, I got a chance to watch this. Really good content. I went archery hunting for pronghorn last year. It was so much fun, but boy, is it hard. <laughs> it is hard. Uh, the closest I ever got was 125 yards. So obviously, Perma, you're doing spot and stock. It was too flat and no vegetation. Yeah, that's why we do a whole chapter in the course about archery hunting. Archery hunting, tags are easier to draw. It's earlier in the season. But man, you are really signing up for a challenge when you decide no oh, yeah, i think i want to chase them with a sharp stick and a string uh <laughs> i've tried it i've done it i've locked out and i've taken a few of them i have way more fun when i'm doing the spot and stock spot and stock gig with them but the amount of shot attempts i get and uh the number of them that i end up hanging a tag on it's really 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 small so uh so Jesse says, I live here in Wyoming and they've tenant, they got the tentative regs out. Yeah, you guys have been having all your meetings in Wyoming. Uh, and it looks like they've taken around 4,500 tags away this year. Yeah. And there are people who are asking, please take more. Please reduce them by more. So when you think about the fact that Wyoming is the cradle of pronghorn in North America. And they... If you look back historically, uh, Wyoming had over 700,000 pronghorn in the early 2000s. Before this hard winter, they had about 360 to 370,000. So we were getting close to half the pronghorn of what we had 18, 20 years ago. Now, so you, you take that. Okay, tags are maybe, I don't know, 60% of what they were in the early 2000s. And then you take a winter like this, where we're going to have such dramatic loss of animals. <sighs> it's unfortunate. 
But here's the good thing I've heard from most hunters. Most of the hunters I've talked to, most of the folks who hang out on our our platforms, on our uh, we we have a big forum called Hunt Talk. Most everybody is saying, you know what? If I got to lay off it for a year or two to let them recover, that's what I'm going to do. Uh, and that's how I feel. You know, if if we have to do this for the sake of of uh, pronghorn, for the sake of mule deer, or whatever uh that's what we got to do that's what hunters have always done we've always responded by saying all right whatever it takes to keep the numbers healthy whatever we got to do towards habitat towards everything else that's what we're going to do uh so i think a lot of the questions today are probably going to be about this brutal winter because most people who come and do their western pronghorn hunt wyoming is at the top of the list just because of sheer numbers but that winter is extending down into Colorado and across eastern Montana. Now, here's the flip side of it where it's going to help pronghorn. Nevada has been in a many, many decade drought. They're getting great moisture. They started getting great moisture last year, just like Arizona did, just like New Mexico did. Those three states in this drought they've had for the last 20 years, every year, pronghorn numbers the tag cuts have been coming and coming and coming. Well, now they're getting moisture that isn't in the form of as much snow. You know, some of it's snow in those states, but not nearly as much. So they're going to be responding probably by increasing uh, pronghorn tags as this moisture starts showing its benefit in a year, two years, three years from now. So uh, it's unfortunate that we have these cycles, that we have these ups and downs, but you know, that's mother nature. That That's the weather. That That's things that uh, we really can't do anything about. Uh, you know, for me personally, a lot of people are asking, well, what am I going to do this year? I'm just, Wyoming is getting hammered, man. I'm, I'm just doing points in Wyoming this year. I, I get a chance to do enough hunting. Uh, I don't need to be there in a year when we need the numbers to rebound. So, uh, I'll focus my pronghorn applications on Utah, uh, Arizona. Well, I already know I didn't dry Arizona because those results are out. Uh, New Mexico. I don't know that I'll draw. Probably won't. Uh, but that's kind of how it goes. Uh, let's see. Here, here's one. Derek says, maybe Game and Fish ought to not even have a pronghorn season this year. Well, uh, I, I think they will. Um, and they'll do so. I, I think what you're going to see is the, the core, the absolute basic foundation for any wildlife herd is the female segment of the population. So I would bet that you're going to see no doe tags to very few doe tags in Wyoming. I'd be very surprised if there are any doe tag, pronghorn doe tags in Wyoming this year. Uh, and if they keep the pronghorn does protected, those herds can recover a lot faster and a lot faster. So I think that's really the mechanism of where hunting uh, can still have the opportunity to hunt because the buck segment, you know, 50% of the, the fawns born or 50% of the population might be bucks at times and they can get recruited in and you can take a few of them and it won't have nearly the consequences to the population that you'll see when you're taking does. So no doe hunting. All right. I, if I was running for, for office this year, it'd be no doe hunting. And I'm talking deer or pronghorn. Uh, so uh, what else we got here for questions? Um, Cause we're uh, let's see. Ben uh, over there in Fresh Tracks Plus is asking, hey, Randy, I hope the hand is healing up. Yep, went to the surgeon today. He's giving me the big thumbs up that I'm on course. Uh, I just finished going through the pronghorn course on outdoor class, and I have to say there was a ton of helpful tips that I would have never thought of otherwise. Thanks for putting it together. Uh, my question is, we have RMEF leading the charge to advocate for elk. Are there organizations that we hunters can support who actively are involved in pronghorn conservation? That is a question I've asked many times. There used to be the North American Pronghorn Foundation based in Rollins, Wyoming. They went out of existence 20 years ago, probably. Uh, we don't have a group that is specific to pronghorn conservation. And uh, 
if there was, uh, I'd be signed up. I'd be a life member. Um, but uh, to my knowledge, there is not one out there. I've heard rumblings that someone would want to uh, start uh, such a group. And if you got the time, energy, and the willpower to do it, count me in, count my platforms in to helping out. So, uh, but anyhow, Ben, appreciate it. Glad you got a lot out of the class. Uh, you know, you think about pronghorn hunting in this class, this is over 30 years of pronghorn hunting for me and hunting multiple states. Uh, I'm going to show you a little book here. Really, it's not a little book. Look how thick it is. This is what I call the pronghorn Bible. Okay. This book here, uh, has everything I've ever wanted to know about pronghorn is in here somewhere. It's Pronghorn Ecology and Management by Bart O'Gara and Jim Yolkum. Uh, you can get it from the Wildlife Management Institute. It's pretty heavy reading. But if you're a pronghorn nerd like me, if you really are fascinated by pronghorn hunting and pronghorn, that's a book that you're going to get a lot of uh, reading time out of. So... Uh, Aaron has this question. My dad and I applied for pronghorn in Wyoming with six points each. Would it be a mistake to burn our points this year? If possible, should we withdraw our application? So the last really hard winter in Wyoming was 2007, 2008 that I was able to hunt that year after. Uh, the 2016, 17 winter, I just sat that out in 2017. I'm like, whew, this is bad. Uh, it turned out not to be quite as bad as I thought it would have been. Uh, but 2007, 2008 was a very tough winter in Wyoming. Matthew drew one of the premium units after that winter. We went down there and we hunted for three days and we did not see a buck that was very impressive. They were, you know, they had their normal mass and they had okay prongs, but they were all short, really short. And we looked at hundreds of them. Talk to the biologists, they're like, well, they came out of the winter in such tough shape. Most of that early energy, most of that early uh, nutrition went to restoring body condition. And once body condition gets restored to a reasonable level, then it will go to horn growth. So, I, you know, pronghorn hunting is fun, Aaron. I don't want to discourage you from it, but it's probably going to be a couple of years before the the quality and the number of pronghorn in Wyoming are what maybe you're hoping for when you're burning six points. But And if you do want to withdraw, you can go in there, go into your account in Wyoming, and you can withdraw your application. But, uh, you know, that, that's up to you. Uh, if you draw, I hope you have a great hunt, and uh, hopefully there's some pronghorn to be had when you're out there. Uh, so uh, just want to remind everybody, you know, tonight, this Pronghorn Live is brought to you by Outdoor Class. Normally, it's by this company, right? You see me all the time talking about Go Hunt Insider. Well, tonight, Outdoor Class is who's bringing this to you. If you want to save some money, use promo code RANDY and you'll get 20% off. Uh, you know, I, I before I talk about my course, I want to talk about all the stuff that's out there at Outdoor Class. You get Corey Jacobson's University of Elk Hunting. You get Remy Morin doing right now his first class on mule deers out there, and we've already filmed another class with Remy. You get my rifle out course. You get Corey's archery out course. You get Jamie Teagan talking about uh, cooking and venison. You get Hank Shaw talking about all of his cooking and, and other stuff. You get John Barclow's uh, back backcountry mission planning course. Uh, this course just launched. You, what's that? Mark Livesey. Yeah, we got another one coming. Mark Livesey is going to be doing uh, e scouting. Uh, we filmed the second course with Hank Shaw. That's going to be coming pretty soon. Bree, um, and then Bree has done Bree's course is another cooking course. Uh, Corey and I are doing two, uh, two probably three mini elk courses this summer. Uh, I know one of them. So many of you ask about cow elk hunting. That's going to be out there. Uh, so outdoor class is the idea that you just keep getting every class, you know, if you're a subscriber, you get the entire library and, uh, hopefully you find it helpful. Uh, 
in my pronghorn course, uh, I talk about a ton of topics, right? I, I feel like it, instead of it being 12 chapters, it could have been 25 chapters. But one of the things we talk about when we're out pronghorn hunting is gear that will help you be successful. And the reason we talk about optics a lot is because the number one sense that pronghorn have, right, for detecting danger is their vision, eight power binocular. So we talk about some of the, the optics you could use, you know, spotters, rifle scopes, binos, range finders, all that. Uh, so here's a little clip from that chapter where we get into, I think it's chapter seven when we talk about equipment. And in that chapter, among all the equipment, we talk about optics and binoculars. So here's a little clip from that, that part of the course. In this course, you've heard me say many times about the vision advantage pronghorn have. Well, one of the primary factors that mitigates a pronghorn's amazing vision advantage is that humans can have even better vision by using quality optics. So, binoculars. I prefer a 10 by 42 binocular for my glassing. It's just a great all-around combination of magnification and objective lens. Now, I know some people prefer a 10 by 50 or even a 12 power or 15 power. Just know that the higher the magnification, the more you'll notice any instability. If you get above 10 power, I would suggest that you use a tripod for stabilization. Now, higher end binoculars have better clarity due to the quality of the lens material and the advanced coatings, and those coatings really help in low light conditions. The odds are you have a pair of binoculars that would suffice for most pronghorn hunting. If you plan to upgrade, upgrade to the highest quality that your budget allows. You won't regret it. So when we talk about optics, that brings out a whole list of questions about magnification. We tried to touch on that. You know, I said my preference is 10. Some people go to a 12 or a 15. Pronghorn hunting is probably the type of hunting where I will never go without a spotting scope. Not so much that I'm going to use it for glassing and scanning everything. It's usually I see these little white dots out there and I need to get a closer look. And that's where a spotting scope, spotting scope uh, serves such great value. And then a range finder out there on the flat prairie. I suck at guessing distances. Uh, I really am dependent upon a range finder anymore. And I just, you know, want to have a high quality range finder because when you're out there, it's flat. The laser is going out of your range finder and it's got to hit a target and bounce back. And the more ambient light, the more it diffuses the, the return reading on the laser. There's just a ton of things where lower quality range finders are not going to help you. You want the best quality range finder you can and use it. I, uh, I'm speaking from experience. Pre-range finder days, uh, there's a couple really nice pronghorn that uh, escaped. <laughs> let's just put it that way. Uh, oh, let's see. Someone says 308 for elk hunting. Yep, for sure. Uh, I'm going to focus tonight though, mostly on the, uh, uh, pronghorn part of this. Hey, I see my buddy Brady Miller is here. Brady's like, I'm buying that book right now. Uh, you better buy your own Brady. Uh, I'm not loaning it to you. Uh, Ryan Kendall is asking me, what's your favorite thing about pronghorn hunting? Oh, man. There's so many things to think, you know, when you think about that list. One, how they taste. I love to eat them. Uh, I love the country they live in. They live in these broken sage, you know, wide open landscapes. That's a ton of fun to, to go and chase them there. They're just unique animals, right? They are, they're, they're so unique to the West and I love everything about them. And here's the other fun part in most places where you draw an antelope tag, you're going to see quite a few of them. So it's not boring in the least. It's like, okay, there's a group, check it out. No, nah, no, nah, maybe not go a little bit further. Oh, there's another group. So 
it's really, really fun hunting. I tell people that I think that pronghorn hunting is the gateway drug to Western hunting. Uh, it's just, it's a ton of fun. It, a lot of skills or a lot of knowledge set of the knowledge set needed for elk or mule deer is learned and can be applied from pronghorn hunting, right? You got to learn how to read a map, public and private, all this stuff. You got to learn how to deal with these big, vast landscapes. You're talking about possibly longer shot distances than maybe the normal whitetail hunter would have. Uh, how do I stay in these remote places and take care of meat in some place that might be three hours from any place I could, could get to a, a cooler or a freezer. So, uh, okay. Nick has a question and I talk about this in the course. Uh, he says, how much time do you spend hiking versus driving? I had success spotting them from the truck, but that's not how I like to hunt. And I get into this in the course because I'm like you, Nick, I would rather go and hike, but a lot of pronghorn country has ranch roads, has two tracks, has, you know, oil and gas roads all over. And so you start hiking and you go 400 yards. Well, there's another two track. Well, you go, the, go this way then, heck with it. You go that way, half mile, there's another two track. So I do end up being very, very mobile when I'm pronghorn hunting because it's more effective. And the other hunters who are out there are using these same oil and gas roads or ranch roads or two track roads, whatever. And so I am moving a lot. And part of that is the more that you move, the more ground you cover, the more you're going to encounter, the more you encounter, the better your chances that it's going to be one that you're really interested in. Uh, and then the other part that I, I touch on in the class is a lot of people drive the road down the main drainage, right? Well, if you get out and you just hike two, 300 yards to the next ridge and look into a basin adjacent to the road that's kind of hidden behind a ridge, these pronghorn are smart. They know that if you hang out by that road, old Joe, he got shot there last year. And so they just move a little bit out of sight, a little bit out of view, a little less uh, molested, if you want to call it that, a little less disturbed. So most of the good pronghorn I find are those times when I put my spotter and my tripod on my shoulder and I go for a two, 300 yard hike, get to a glassing knob, and I look out into those little cuts and folds away from the road that those pronghorn are hiding in. You'd be surprised how many nice bucks are in those places and there's vehicles just boom, boom, driving back and forth and they don't even see any of those bucks. So uh, that's that's one of those, I'm with you, Nick, one of those kind of inner conflicts about this isn't normally my hunting style, but it's really how I got to do it. So uh, so Jake asks, hey Randy, is there a way to e-scout pronghorn similar to elk or mule deer? There is, uh, you know, in the book or in the course, we go into, instead of five periods of, of the hunting season, like we have for elk, we have three main periods of hunting season for pronghorn. We have pre-rut, peak rut, and post rut. And uh, we go into a lot of that stuff. And when you see the things we talk about, what are the primary influences? What are the needs in each of those three situations or those three calendar periods? And then what are the, the behaviors of pronghorn that you can count on in each of those three calendar periods? That makes e-scouting for them far easier, much easier. So uh, I'd, uh, I'd go in and look at that part of it. I think you'd, you'd find a, a lot there uh, in the course that maybe you'd say, oh, yeah, I can adapt to that. I, I can make that an e-scouting plan. So uh so i'm gonna ask this question of ryan bailey our executive producer of outdoor class who's sitting right here with me while he's behind my computer here ryan peter wants to know any plans for a turkey course at outdoor class big plans big plans there you heard it right there big plans uh and uh we have such an amazing crew that is here producing outdoor class uh it's why the, if you look at the production level of outdoor class, 
it is beyond anything you're going to see out there. And it's because of these folks, Ryan and Ryan and Emily and uh, Ariel and Harrison, everybody. Uh, we're lucky to have those kind of people working uh, at Outdoor Class. And so not only is the content great, and hopefully some of the SMEs, what we call them SME, subject matter experts, they are true experts, right? Most of these people that you see who have done classes, you've heard about, you know that they have been there, done that with whatever species it is. So uh, Ridgeline asks, what would be your number one state to get a pronghorn tag? I'm in a state right now that doesn't offer a pronghorn tag. Uh, the answer to that for me is usually yes. In other words, I'll take whatever pronghorn tag I can get. But if you've watched my videos about how I rank each state for pronghorn, it's a combination of access to tags, public land versus private land, uh, cost, number of animals, uh, age class of animals. You'll see that when you blend all of that together, Wyoming is always at the top of my list. Well, now with a hard winter like that, that we're having right now, Wyoming is going to sink down my list for a couple of years, probably. If you get rid of just how hard it is to draw a tag and you don't weigh that into the consideration, it's a toss up between Arizona, Nevada, and uh, New Mexico. Yeah. If you gave me a, a tag for any of those three states, I'd be there so fast. Uh, so uh, apply to those states. The Arizona deadline's already gone. Uh, the New Mexico deadline's already passed. The Nevada deadline's coming up May 10th, I believe it is. Uh, and so the, the Wyoming deadline is May 31st, but I think we see the writing on the wall of what Wyoming's going to look like this year with the hard winter. So for me, I'm, I'm just doing points. But Joseph asks, have I ever hunted Idaho for antelope? I have not. Uh, so... Uh, I hope someday that I will. Um, uh, let's see. Zach asks, is it still worth trying to burn points this year in Wyoming? Looking to burn nine points. Whew, man, I I don't know about that. That's, uh, huh. <laughs> uh, dang. I'd recommend against it. I, I'd suggest uh, if if you're uh, sitting on a lot of points, maybe wait a couple years. Um so, uh, Pro Vasquez says the production quality is ridiculously good for outdoor class. I love outdoor class so far. Glad to hear that. I'm sure they're happy to hear that. Uh, Katie asks, would you recommend signing up for outdoor class as a beginning hunter? Yes, I would suggest. In fact, I would say that if you are a hunter of pretty much any level, you're going to get a lot out of this. I, I just, uh, did a whole podcast with John Barclow about his backcountry mission planning. And in preparation for doing the podcast with John, I went through and watched his course. And I've been doing this a long time. The amount of stuff I learned, uh, man, it, John is a true subject matter expert. The amount of stuff I learned in watching Hank Shaw's class, Jamie's class, uh, Remy's class. I, I, there, there's stuff there for everybody. And uh, I wouldn't think of it as just, oh, this is only for beginners or this is only for whatever. This is, uh, this, this is a lot of content. It's a lot of work. If you saw how much work the subject matter experts invest in creating scripts, right? We're, we're, we're trying to take, okay, we have this knowledge. How do we make it consumable from a teaching and instructional standpoint? So you do that. And then you give the script to Ryan and his crew and they work with you to get it kind of condensed, even though it might seem long. Uh, it's, it's condensed from what the SMEs or the subject matter experts would normally do. And then we go shoot it and then they start doing rough edits and then they add all the graphics, all the everything else. It's, it's a really complicated process, but I, I like seeing these comments where folks say, oh, the quality is worth every bit of it. Uh, so, uh, the, Kavik asks, uh, Randy, I love that funky horn pronghorn behind you. Uh, yeah, 
he he's a Wyoming buck. Uh, I was chasing him down in Wyoming in 2004. And well, actually, I was chasing a different buck. And this dude happens to step out. I'm like, all right, pal, you'll do. <laughs> and uh, it was rainy and foggy. And he steps out and too bad for him. Uh, let's see. Oh, Chris says, hey, Randy, is it possible for me to ever draw an Arizona pronghorn tag? I'm currently at three points. It's possible, but it's, you know, it's very tough. Uh, I drew an archery tag there with 16 points. That's how many points I had in 2011 when I drew. So now I'm back up with my loyalty point and my hunter ed point. I think I'm back up to, I don't know. 11 or 12 points and i'm not waiting on drawing anytime soon so uh i guess there's always a chance because it's a bonus point state but your chances is, is pretty slim uh cassandra says my dream hunt is antelope in wyoming but now i'm discouraged where would you recommend to go for our first antelope hunt other than wyoming uh cassandra i, I think you might live in Oregon if I remember right but uh anyhow other states that I'd look at right now might be Nevada uh you know New Mexico it's just really really hard to draw in New Mexico uh Oregon is is a hard place to draw but it's got great pronghorn hunting in the places where they exist uh you know, Eastern Colorado has not had nearly the winter of Western Colorado. So the plains of Eastern Colorado would be another good opportunity, specifically Southeast Colorado. Uh, unfortunately, that deadline was yesterday. Uh, so you might be late on that. But uh, either way, uh, you know, this these weather cycles, they have an effect for two to three years. So uh, you're going to have to be thinking about this stuff for next year also. So next year, be thinking about, okay, what about Nevada? What about Eastern Colorado? What about Arizona? What about New Mexico? And hopefully Montana, uh, Northern Colorado, Wyoming, kind of the heart of the pronghorn numbers of, of the United States. Hopefully they'll, uh, they'll bounce back and, uh, We'll be doing better and uh you know it's just an unfortunate thing about how it is so uh what else we got here i'm trying to read so many different live streams uh <laughs> i hope i'm i'm uh not messed up uh sean's from nevada he said rumor out here is that tags will be going up next year the surveys are going on right now no preliminary preliminary numbers but the chatter is positive yeah just prior to that uh there pr prior to you coming on sean i mentioned how as dismal as this might sound for the northern states this moisture is a godsend for nevada for southern utah for arizona for new mexico places that have been in decade you know two three decades of severe drought and your state in Nevada has a history of cranking up tag numbers as quick as moisture lets the populations rebound. So they do that for deer, for elk, for pronghorn. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, as much as it's doom and gloom up here in Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, and maybe some of Colorado. For the other places, this moisture is super, super helpful. Uh Gary asked Randy, how many points to draw a good Colorado pronghorn hunt? Um, before the change this year, I would have said if you're an archery hunter, three to four. If you're a rifle hunter, six to eight. But now this year, they changed it for 2023, where non-residents only get 35% of the pronghorn tag. So that's going to make it a little bit more difficult. Uh, it'll be interesting to see where those point numbers shake out. But right now... Uh, it's uh it's probably gonna bump a little bit for non-residents um jared asks have i ever hunted pronghorn in nebraska i have not that's one of the states that i have not hunted pronghorn in i've not i think i've well california i don't apply there so i wouldn't ever be able to draw if i don't apply 
Uh, but I haven't drawn in Idaho. I haven't drawn in Oregon. And I haven't hunted Nebraska or the Dakotas. So I guess I still got a bunch of pronghorn hunts to check off my list someday. Uh, I, I just enjoy pronghorn. They're such an amazing animal. And if you saw the way that the inventory in my freezer moves along, the pronghorn goes, Hoom! I'll share my elk meat with you. But if you come and ask me for pronghorn, I'll be busy that day. But uh, Ryan has a question. Randy, I was thinking of tossing my hat in the ring for a Southwest Montana pronghorn tag this year. Has Southwest Montana bit been hit as hard as what's been happening in Wyoming? Yeah, it's been hit pretty darn hard, but not as bad as Wyoming. Uh, you know, our deadline for pronghorn in Montana is June 1st. Um, we'll, we'll have some preliminary idea of how bad it was in Montana for pronghorn, but in Southwest Montana... Yeah, it's, it's been pretty tough. Uh, the, the benefit of Southwest Montana is we do have some valleys where we get strong winds and it can keep some of it free of snow. But I don't want to say that that's necessarily the case. Um, I, I just, I wish I had better news for everybody. I wish we were doing this and releasing this class of, guess what, Wyoming just tripled pronghorn numbers and Colorado pronghorn tags for everybody. And Eastern Montana, they can't get rid of enough pronghorn. But unfortunately, we're in one of those weather cycles where that's uh, that's not the reality of the situation. But uh, So someone asked, what does pronghorn taste like? Uh, goat, venison, lamb? To me, pronghorn tastes like a mix, uh, a cross between bison and moose. It's sweeter tasting. Uh, its texture is, for me, in, in my mind, is is softer and and easier. Uh, and it just, it, you'll hear people say, oh, yeah, the stinky things, man. They, I'm not cooking one of those. I've run over 50 pronghorn through my freezer. And I have never had a bad one yet. And some might say, well, you just got lucky, Randy. Okay, maybe I just got lucky. Uh, but I think that the biggest reason is how quickly we get them cooled off, how we take care of them in the field. That's the biggest issue related to the quality of what the pronghorn is going to taste like. Uh, Joseph asks, is sitting water in a blind the most productive way to archery hunt antelope? Yes. And we talk about that in the course. We even talk about what water holes they prefer versus which ones they don't prefer. We talk about how to set up your blind in relation to the sun. We talk about how to take a big water source and kind of coordinate off with flagging and, and rope to get them to come in closer to your blind. We talk about all kinds of things related to that. Uh a lot of you may wonder, when does a pronghorn water, what's the peak of watering? When I'm sitting in my blind, I only have, you know, half a day. Do I want to go in the morning or afternoon? Well, if you watch a course, you're going to know you want to be sitting in that blind in the morning. Because there's been tons of studies on this stuff. So, uh, there's a lot of things that go into that, that I, I think when you see the, how we've taken information in this book and in other places, my 30 some years of hunting pronghorn and helping others on pronghorn hunts, there'll be some, some useful stuff in uh, how we present that information. So, uh, well, we got one more clip. Everyone's been hanging around for a while. And uh, I think it's time to show this final clip from the course. Um, and I'm confident that the, the information here will help you get your animal. So we wanted to take some time to talk about how to care for that animal when you get that one. Uh, so uh, right here, this is a, a clip out of chapter 11 about keeping the meat clean. So we'll see how this one goes. It clean. The odds are wherever you're going to have to take care of this animal out in the field, there's a lot of dirt and dust and grass and other items that could contaminate your meat. Once you're done with your photos, clear a place for you to do this important work of meat care. It's preferable to not have bare dirt, but sometimes that's just not possible. 
If I was you, I'd carry a small tarp for this purpose in the event you're not able to find a spot void of dirt and debris. It's amazing how much a small tarp will help. Now, if you're gonna do the gutless method or another manner of quartering your animal on the ground, it will be imperative that you have a solution to keep the dirt off the meat that you take from the carcass because dirt is hard to clean off the meat once it gets on there. If you're doing the traditional gutting method, make the smallest abdominal cut necessary for removing the entrails. That small opening will reduce the likelihood of dirt, hair, and debris going in and touching your meat. But remember this, that also restricts how fast the meat can cool. So if you're doing the traditional gutting method, use a tarp or some other protection to keep from damaging the hair while transporting to the location where you will eventually hang this buck and remove its hide and start breaking down the meat. This is probably the one you got to pay the most attention to because in pronghorn season, it's hot. So there you see that clip. That's how confident I am that if you get a pronghorn tag, you're going to feel that tag. I'm so confident that we did a whole chapter on how to be fast, but how to be clean and how to be gentle. Uh, in that, we talk about how to do it in the field, how to keep everything clean. We also talk about, okay, pronghorn, like this guy right behind me here, they're a pretty unique species. Maybe you want to do a full taxidermy mount like this one, or maybe like oh, up here above me, I'm, I'm kind of lost here. Everything's reverse. Uh, this European mount, we talk about how you do that. So we go into a lot of stuff that uh, make sure we're utilizing every part of that pronghorn that we possibly can. The meat, the hide, the horns, the everything. So uh, I was uh, adamant that that has to be in there. And fortunately, Ryan and the crew at Outdoor Class are like, well, yeah, we're not going to do a course without telling you how to take care of it. So, uh, but, <clears throat> so we got a whole bunch of questions that came past here. Um, and, uh, so Kavik says lean sirloin is how my antelope tastes the best tasting game meat behind Oryx. Okay. I've never had Oryx. So right now it's the best tasting game meat for me, uh, cause I've never had Oryx. Uh, but want to make sure that everybody knows, you know, that clip you just saw. Uh, want to thank Outdoor Class for sponsoring this live stream. Uh, and this is the last reminder. You know, we're going to go through a bunch more questions here before we wrap up. But uh, if you want to save 20% on Outdoor Class, go to OutdoorClass.com. Use promo code Randy and they'll give you 20% off. And like we said, you're going to get everything that's out there on the platform. From me, from Corey Jacobson, Remy Warren, Hank Shaw, John Barclow, Jamie Teagan, da, 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 da. the list goes on and on. And there's a lot more stuff that's in the works that's uh, coming pretty soon. So uh, if it's something that interests you, uh, I think you'll get a lot out of it. Uh, so Dan says, my wife, the, ec the expert, says antelope and axis deer are the best game that she's ever had. Okay, I'll go with that, Dan. Uh, let's see. Sean asks, when will we see you in the new kitchen studio showing us your favorite antelope recipe? Well, here's what we're trying to do, right? My wife is camera shy. None of you have ever seen my wife on camera before, but she is the best of anybody I know. And we should do an outdoor class with her. Randy's Wild Game Recipes by Kim Newberg. I'm trying to convince her to come to our kitchen studio and do two things. Make the chili, her pronghorn chili is off the charts, like as unbelievable as you can imagine. And some of you are saying, wait a second, Randy, you almost died of five alarm chili in New Mexico. You're still eating pronghorn? My wife worked on a chili recipe for 20 years, tweaking this and trying this idea, trying that idea. Finally, she nailed it. I mean, like, perfect like beyond anything everyone who eats it is like holy crap where, where can i get some of this uh so we're thinking about doing that and if you've ever been out on a well you, you haven't been out on a trip with us but if you 
see some of our videos, my wife makes antelope lasagna that is to die for. And what she does, she makes trays of it. And then she cuts it up and she puts it in a vacuum sealing bag, seals it. And when we freeze it, we keep it froze till we get out there. And then it slowly thaws over the few days of being there. And you take this little package, this, well, I ask her to make pretty big packages. And you drop it in to this, uh, you know, we have like a great big teapot. You drop it in there and you boil it for like 10 minutes. You pull it out, you cut it open and you slide it onto your plate. Steaming hot, unbelievable antelope lasagna. So those are two recipes I'd like to tell you I was going to do in our kitchen, our new studio kitchen. But I'm here to tell you, I'm not as good as Kim Newberg. So would we, would you rather have her do it? Yeah. I know you would, but maybe we'll just have her telling me how to do it, if if that's better. So, um, you know, one thing we didn't really get into uh, in deep detail on the course is a lot of people ask questions about, I want to shoot uh, a big prong or I want to shoot one that makes the record book or whatever. And we touch on some things about, you know, at what age and, and other stuff like that, but uh Pronghorn hunting is so fun because you can make of it what you want. You can put a lot of effort into it, or you could probably fill your tag by nine o'clock the first morning. Uh, if you want to hold out, if you're like me, you know, I've been blessed to have a lot of pronghorn tags. Uh, I'm always looking for something funky, like this guy behind me right here that, that's got the, the wigged out horn. I was chasing one that was bigger than him, but I'm like, bummer of a birthmark dude man you, you you're going for a victory lap uh so i'm usually looking for something goofy uh because if i just said oh i want to shoot the first one i see my hunts would be over and i wouldn't get a chance to enjoy all of what pronghorn represents and pronghorn hunting so uh we touch on some of that uh, but we don't get too far into it. We give you some basic ideas about how mass is most important, followed by prong, and then horn length. And we go into some things where certain horn types and horn styles or formations can kind of fake you out, right? Like if it hooks way in, that's helpful because you're going to get about an extra inch, inch and a half of length. If it hooks way back, you're going to get a bunch of extra length. So, uh, but it's... Uh, it's just make what you want out of your, your pronghorn hunt. It's uh, so much fun. Uh, Cody says, Randy, are you finally going to burn your Utah, Utah pronghorn points this year? I'm going to try, but here's another thing about my family. Hunting is a really social thing. So Matthew and I both have a lot of pronghorn points. I have a ton. I'm the, at the highest po point level for any non-residents. And he's way up there. I think he's got 14. So there's not too many units where you can get do a party application in Utah. But there's a couple. So we keep trying to do a party application. And we're always like just one point below. So if ever they take our points, we'll be there. Uh, but given the opportunity of, okay, I could go by myself and have a great time, I'm sure. Or I could go there with Matthew and it could be time for he and I to do one of our annual hunts each year no brainer. I'll just keep waiting until his points build up enough that we know we're, we're in the running in Utah. Um, so, you know, one of the things that, that is often discussed out there, uh, with pronghorn is, Oh yeah, you, you have to be able to shoot at 800 yards. You know, if you can shoot 800 yards, great, but I'm not wanting to, uh, get people thinking that's the only way you can kill a pronghorn, right? People kill them with a bow at 20 yards. So uh, most of my pronghorn, I'm trying to think, I've shot one pronghorn that I can recall that was over 400 yards. Most of them are somewhere in that 150 to 250 yard distance. So the beauty of pronghorn is not equipment intensive. Whatever rifle you use for deer is more than adequate for pronghorn. You, you, you know, we're not talking about the great backpacks you see us using when we're out, you know, doing backpack elk hunts and stuff. 
it's just so much easier to get into it. Uh, so Ron says, why don't I talk about the rifle caliber or cartridge and scope that I use? Okay. Uh, I use most of the time I'm using my Howa 7mm08, 140 grain Nosler Acubon, and I got a Leupold VX5 3-15 to on there. That that takes care of everything. I've shot moose with that setup. I've shot pronghorn with that setup. I've, I've shot wolves with that setup. I've, it's a little bit of everything. It, it, that's what I use. You know, I've in the last few years, I've grown pretty fond of the 6.5 uh, PRC. Uh, I took a buck in Nevada last year with the 6.5 PRC. Uh, again, a Howa. This had 140 grain uh, Nosler Acubon and had a three to five uh leupold vx5 on it so uh you know it's it's not some crazy setup right it's pretty i don't want to say run of the mill it's a quality setup but of all the pronghorn we took last year uh matthew took well the, the one he took was the furthest it was right at 400 yards and and that's rare uh the other two pronghorn we took uh took one at like 110 yards and another one at i think 180 yards or something like that 200 yards so uh it's it's not this long range long bombing situation that a lot of people want to make it out to be for me the fun of pronghorn is also seeing how close i can get uh and i i've had pretty good luck getting pretty close uh Zach asks how far from a public private boundary does a pronghorn have to be before i will shoot um you know they're pretty fragile animals um i will uh i'll shoot one you know uh, obviously i'd want there to be a fence because you just never know if they take off running that way i, I want to be careful and if i can i'd rather be between them and the private boundary because when i shoot they're usually going to go the other way um so zeke gets he asks a really good question uh this is one of the things we go into in great detail in there about the three calendar periods zeke asks what is the behavior of the last week of september would that be pre-rut no that would be peak rut zeke and they are acting crazy they are fighting the mature bucks are posturing you got satellite bucks hanging around thinking boy i sure would like to sneak in here and then you see the mature buck chasing these other bucks just tearing across the prairie the peak rut for pronghorn is about September 5th to October 5th to 10th. Then you get into the post rut, post rut, they all get back into great big herds, herds of 50, 80, 100, and they're all happy and get along. These same bucks that were fighting each other two weeks ago are now like best pals. Uh, and there they switch, when you get to the post rut, they switch to a feed pattern instead of a breeding and rutting pattern. So uh lots of things that that we cover in there um so let's see habitat yes habitat 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 i'm glad to see all these uh comments about habitat uh taking the lesson come far program says taking the lesson learned from 2023 what can pronghorn advocates do to ensure our herds are more elastic to winter and other things that we can't control and that's what i was talking about earlier is abundant habitat high quality habitat and no infringement on their migration because these are species that evolve being able to migrate and move across these big landscapes to satisfy their needs you know to get to the wind-blown ridges when the snow is deep to find that sage it isn't snow covered so those are the things we need to be working on uh two years ago me and the crew we went down to southwest montana uh, outside of dillon and we spent an entire day pulling a fence that was infringing on the ability for pronghorn to move and after we did our day of work they had another group come in and another group over the course of that a couple of weeks that summer, I don't know how many miles of fence was pulled, but it was a lot. And it was one of those things where they had uh, uh, camera traps or trail cameras, whatever you want to call it, of all of these pronghorn that would just walk back and forth across along this fence. And they were looking for a place to cross and they wouldn't cross. Well, that makes them more susceptible to predation. 
it keeps from them from getting to the key habitats they need in whatever season, right? They need a separate type of habitat when they're fawning and, and having their little ones. And they have a separate type that they need once the, the fawns are born. And then they need another type of winter habitat. So this whole mix of habitat out there is super important. And those are the things we got to focus on. And when we're focusing on that for pronghorn, guess what? We're helping mule deer. We're helping sage grouse. We're helping all the species. So uh, it's unfortunate that pronghorn kind of get dealt the, the raw deal when it comes to consideration for, for their habitat needs. But it's a, a winter like this that absolutely uh, nails it and, and makes it very obvious about why we need to be focused on that. So uh Eric asks, so in late September, a white pillow sheet and or a decoy could be very beneficial. No, because those are just about always rifle hunts. Maybe a white pillow sheet, but not a decoy. Never use a decoy in a rifle season. And that's mostly when the rifle seasons are. Now, if you want to put a white flag on, a lot of people do that. And antelope are very curious. Sometimes they'll come walking in and they'll be looking and peeking and trying to figure something out. Uh, we go into a lot of, of tactics and strategies in there about decoying. In that class, we talk about decoying. We talk about water blinds. Uh, we talk about spot and stock. We talk about how to use the sun as your ally, right? When an antelope is looking into the sun, it's kind of like us looking into the sun. This eight power vision advantage they have starts shrinking. At low light, this eight power vision advantage, advantage starts shrinking. So we have all these mechanisms that we can use, that we can do, that will maybe balance it out a little bit in our favor. And that's the whole idea of, of a course like this, is to teach you the little bits and pieces where you can take their physiology, their needs, their habits, and convert that into hunting strategies and then tactics. Because we have the overall strategy of how to find them and what they do. But then we get into some of these tactics about how do you locate one? The fact that you can put them to bed at night and unless they're bumped by a predator, they're not going to move hardly at all because at night their vision is no nowhere near what it is uh, during the heat of the day. So uh, a lot of stuff in there, more stuff than we can cover here. That, that's for sure. Uh, but let's see. All of a sudden we get a big flurry of of uh questions uh, uh let's see <laughs> paul says really hard to get a tag for pronghorn in idaho you almost have to inherit one in a will <laughs> uh, ron says i'm 71 and you are the best well thank you ron i appreciate that getting a pronghorn is at the top of my bucket bucket list of things to do with my 30 year old son go do that you will not regret it uh I think this is Jared who said, got it. A wise person once told me, put your shoulder to the wheel, question mark. Uh, yeah, Jim Posowitz used to say that. Uh, and he knew a lot about uh, habitat and conservation. I just steal that from him once in a while. Um, let's see. Hey, Randy, which one of your signature Howler rifles and caliber might I use for pronghorn? We have a 6.5 Creedmoor. We have a 7mm08. I have a 308. It has a 243. There's, uh, there's pretty much all of them. Uh, so let's see. Um, Randy, with the conditions of what they are, if I were to pull a Wyoming tag application, would I lose my points? No. Nope. If you withdraw your application now, you have July, August, September, and possibly even October to go into what they call their point purchase period. So you can go in there and you can buy points only. Uh, so, uh, you'll, you'll be good if you withdraw your application that you've already submitted. So, uh, let's see, I'm trying to see if we got any more that I've missed. Um, I think we're, we're doing good here. I really want to thank Ryan and his crew at outdoor class for the great work they did. I want to thank Ryan for being here tonight on this, uh, live stream, uh, He's a, a great guy. He's a fanatic hunter also. You know, I, I don't know how, how he works so hard in hunting season. Uh, we must uh, 
really have him and the other Ryan, Ryan Kendall. They're, they're both fanatic hunters. Uh, they did get a chance to go do some mule deer hunting last year. I remember that. And then they came down to Nevada and they joined me on a pronghorn hunt. Uh, but I dilly dallied around so long. I didn't shoot one until after they'd left. So, uh, but anyhow, thank you all for being here. Thanks to outdoor class for sponsoring this. If you want this course and all kinds of other great information, go to outdoorclass.com. Uh, use promo code Randy. When you sign up, they'll give you 20% off. And just know that when you subscribe at Outdoor Class, this is information from people who have been there, who've done it, who are the kind of folks who you can trust the information that they're giving you. And there is a ton more of, of information and more courses to come. So thanks for being here tonight. Really appreciate it. And uh, look forward to hearing some of your pronghorn stories uh, when you guys get through this season and, and seasons ahead. I'm looking for the feedback from all of you, and uh, maybe we'll get my wife to come and share those those two pronghorn recipes that I was talking about. Chili, and my favorite, lasagna. Uh, if you told me I had to eat my wife's pronghorn lasagna for the rest of my life, I could do that. I really could do that. So, thank you all for being here. Have a good evening. Time for me to head home. Thanks so much. Outdoorclass.com, promo code RAIN. Hey folks, welcome to our course on rifle elk hunting. In this outdoor class, I'm gonna give you my secrets to finding big bucks. Like most of you, my connection to wild game is centered around family. For me, that thrill of in your face elk bugling has no rival in the hunting woods. Consider this your entree into the world of venison cookery. The purpose of this course is to teach you about North American pronghorn. We'll focus on pronghorn habits and needs on which are based the best tactics, specifically hunting tactics for mature bucks on public land. First, I want to get you excited about pronghorn. Pronghorn, in my mind, are as cool as cool gets for many reasons. They're the speed merchants of North America. They can detect danger from miles away and they can outrun every predator they face. Pronghorn inhabit some of our most remarkable and harshest landscapes. The lonely prairies and vast sage foothills are fun places to explore. In most places pronghorn exist, they are very abundant providing a lot of excitement to each hunting day. Lastly, pronghorn are great to eat. Add all that together and pronghorn hunting is flat out fun. Pure pleasure. The most pleasurable of all of my hunts. Here's my approach to hunting any species. Based on years of observing the hunters who are most successful, whatever species we might be talking about whether it's elk, mule deer, whitetails, or in this case, pronghorn, consistently successful hunters are borderline scientists. They become students of that species using that information to connect the dots to their hunting success. That success comes when we mitigate the animal's strengths and we exploit their weakness. That is what we're gonna do in this course. We'll learn where pronghorn have the advantage and what hunters can do to mitigate that advantage. And we'll learn where pronghorn have some chinks in their armor, giving hunters a bit of an advantage. To effectively hunt pronghorn, we need to know about them, their physiology, their biology, and the landscapes they inhabit. That information supports our plan to effectively find them and then hunt them. When you're done with this course, you'll be able to plan, scout, and have a successful pronghorn hunt with either a bow or a firearm.